Hey guys, Darkovica here, and uh, this is a very unplanned vlog, which is very weird for me. I, I usually have eight different scripts written out by the time I start these, and uh, look, I'm a mess. So today, we're going to be talking about something interesting, and I know we had talked about doing some creative stuff coming up for Inktober and NaNoWriMo. I have been doing Inktober, sort of. <laughs> I'm a little behind, um, but I've been mostly posting it on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, now, this video has to do with NaNoWriMo, which for those of you who have not seen my previous video, NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month, which actually takes place in the month of November, in which you work uh, to write 50,000 words in a single month. So you have from the start of November to write 50,000 words. Uh, technically, the idea is you start completely fresh, brand new, and you do not stop. No matter how bad your content is, you just go. You just steamroll right on through that. Now, there are some ways to prepare for NaNoWriMo, um, like making sure you have a, uh, a outline. I've been forgetting that word all day. Um, making sure you have an outline before you actually start NaNoWriMo, because if you don't have... <laughs> the camera is shaking because Brent's leg is... Uh... <laughs> I was like, why is OBS shaking? <laughs> um, yeah, so having an outline is basically a great way to jump into NaNoWriMo because you know where your story is supposed to go. If you don't know where your story is supposed to go, a lot of things can happen. Some people work really well with that. Sometimes I work well with that. Um, outlines are not meant to be, just as a heads up, outlines are not meant to be glue. You're not supposed to stick to your outline. It is supposed to basically be a way for you to have a guardrail. And then when you feel the story taking off in a natural direction, you take that direction and just change your outline. Um, it's like a guideline. Um, not necessarily rules, but guidelines. I don't know, that wasn't the right accent or the right quote from Pirates, but you get my drift. So today's video is not about outlines, like it may have seemed for the last two minutes. It's actually about the hero's journey, which is a concept that was actually surprisingly new to me. I know I had talked about it, or I had learned about it briefly when I was going to community college, but we didn't talk about it for more than a day, like at most. Um, now, Brent actually was the one who brought it to my attention because I was struggling a lot with my story over the past couple of years. And, um, and so Brent was like, well, why aren't you working with the hero's journey? And I was like, that sounds really familiar. And he was like, yeah, we need to go over that. <laughs> So I am now going to share the hero's journey with you guys. I still don't fully have the hero's journey down. So this is not supposed to really be a, a golden video that you use for the rest of your life. This is to help you start learning about the hero's journey. And then you can add to the discourse on it in the comment section below. Um, but basically, and I even have like an image open on my second screen. So if you see me like this, it's because I don't remember. <laughs> I also have literally a notebook right here of several versions. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. I said I didn't actually come into this prepared, but I did. Um, of the hero's journey. And there are, there are different kinds. There is the hero with a thousand faces, which I think was the initial version of the hero's journey. That one is a little complicated, and I don't know how to explain that one all the way through. Um, I can go through the steps of that one, but basically... What they all have in common is the hero's journey is broken down into three acts. And one of the outline uh, exercises that I was looking at called the snowflake theory. The snowflake, eh, whatever, it was snowflake something. Um, it, is a, it, it mentioned that your book should also have three tragedies and then an ending. And that's ba those are like basic guidelines. Like if you can make your book work around that then do so. Same thing with the hero's journey. The hero's journey is a basic breakdown of all stories. Now, these stories do not necessarily happen in this order, and that does not, and that, bleh, excuse me, that means yours does not need to happen in that, uh, whatever I just said, that cat, I'm really tired for some reason. My brain is just like, <laughs> um, so basically, your story does not need to go in that order either. So, 
let's start with this before I get on in a whole other sidetrack. So the hero's journey starts with act one and act one is meant to take place in the ordinary world. And the ordinary world is the world in which your hero is born and lives in and starts in. So it's their day to day life, whether they like it or not, it's where they start. So you, it, your first step to the hero's journey is the ordinary world. You're explaining this world to your readers. So like, for example, let's use, um, now, there might be some spoilers in this because I have to use examples. I apologize, but for our first example, let me use Aragon because for some reason I remember that book really well. Like, I use Aragon all the time when I'm contemplating the hero's journey to break this down. Um, or, you know what? Let's use a more no a well-known one instead of that one. Let's use the Lord of the Rings. Everybody knows the Lord of the Rings. If you don't know the Lord of the Rings, shame. Um, let's use the Lord of the Rings. Ordinary World is the Shire, where Frodo grows up. It is this peaceful, never-changing universe where nothing exciting ever happens. And we see that Frodo wants to leave the Shire, but doesn't want to leave the Shire. The idea is that there has to be a reason for your hero to deny the call to adventure. If you have too much of a reason for them to leave, then why are they in this world at all kind of a business? Like, why haven't they already left? You need something to show your audience that they have a reluctance to go on this adventure. For Frodo, it was a love of, you know, hobbits and the Shire, but it was also that love that forced him to leave the Shire because he realized if he stayed, he was harming the thing that he loved the most and also you know rings and ring wraiths and things were getting bad um so you have your ordinary world and you have your call to adventure so the, the first steps basically for this world is ordinary world call to adventure refusal of the call and meeting the mentor obviously this can happen in a number of different this can happen in different order like uh, gandalf comes at the very beginning of the movie or book excuse me Obviously, book him first. Gandalf comes, like, right off the bat. And he's the mentor, clearly. Um, but, you know, you have your mentor who is meant to guide Frodo. In the case of Aragorn, it was uh, Brom. almost forgot his name. Um, Aragorn's mentor was Brom, And he was also introduced pretty early on. Now, your hero is meant to receive the call to adventure and then immediately, excuse me, immediately refuse it. So in this case, Frodo actually dallied for like 11 years, I think, in the book. In the movie, I think it was like a couple months. In the in in, uh, in the book, I, I think I said that wrong. In the movie, it was a couple months. In the book, I think he literally put off going on his adventure for like 20 years or something ridiculous like that. Um, he was just like, oh, I'll go later. And then like another season would pass and it was just like longer and longer and longer. Uh, Lord of the Rings is actually quite slow in the books. And then it, once it takes off, oh, man, everything's happening all at once. But, like, in the beginning, like, Bilbo has the ring for, like, 70 years. <laughs> Nothing happens. So, you know, takes its time. Um, like I said, spoilers. But anyways, um, so basically you have your refusal of the call and then you have your, you know, your mentor coming in and then the crossing of the threshold. Now, the thresh the crossing of the threshold is extremely important because it takes your, your hero from the ordinary world into the special world and the special world is a term used for this unseen world that they've been wanting to get into but afraid to get into for Frodo it is the truth like the veil has been lifted and he sees the world that it actually is and he can't go back it's this idea where oh actually there's like an even there's a literal moment in the movie where Sam stands at the edge of the field and Frodo turns to look at him and he says this is the furthest I've ever gone in the Shire if I take one more step He's basically crossing a threshold for Sam. Same thing happened, you know, that one's, that's like a literal threshold that Sam crosses into the special world. And it's, it's, that's basically what it is. And for Aragon, I think it's when he decides to keep the dragon is when he crosses the threshold. It's either that or, well, we won't go because that's definitely, that's definite spoilers. But anyways, we'll stick with Lord of the Rings. Um... So once they're in that special world, they can't go back. There's, you know, either it's an emotional thing that's holding them back or it's, it's, you know, like a physical thing holding them back. If Frodo goes back with the ring, he gonna die. Everyone gonna die. The bad guy's gonna get the ring. Like, that's just, it's not happening. He can't go back. And he, know, he understands that. And all of a sudden he regrets wanting to leave the Shire, which is the idea. You know, they realize that what they had was not that bad, but now they can't go back. They can't have it anymore. So uh, now that we're in the special world, we have new steps. Again, checking my reference material. You can literally Google this. I just like, it's, it's ancient. There ain't no copyright on this. Um, 
At least I don't think so. So you have six, which is tests, allies, and enemies. And then you have approach. And then, oh, I know what that is. And then you have ordeal, death, and rebirth. So you start off with your character meeting their their allies, their enemies, and going through a series of tests. A lot of the times, like in westerns, this happens in areas like saloons or bars. And that's because it's just a really like communicative place where your characters are able to talk with a bunch of people and you're introduced to friends and allies. For example, in Lord of the Rings, we go to the Prancing Pony where Frodo meets Strider, who becomes an integral character. And also, we really get to see those ring wraiths and what they're capable of. And then so starts the test of them trying to get to Rivendell. So it's this major, like, oh, and, you know, like, just literally trying to survive the nights that it takes them to get from the Prancing Pony to Rivendell. So, Rivendell? Riverdell? Oh, God, it's Rivendell. Um... So now you have the approach, which I believe is is also called something else. Yeah, the approach to the innermost cave. That's what it was. So the approach to the innermost cave is literally the approach to the, like, penultimate location where everything is just about to go down. And in Lord, of, the original Lord of the Rings, that is the Mines of Moria. So the first one, Fellowship. Not, not the series as a whole, but literally your first book. And that's, that is another good point. Your hero's journey is meant to apply. If you have multiple books, it still applies to every single book. That journey starts over every book. No matter how far in your story is going, you still need all of this. So your ordinary world is just like, you know, you're, you're, it obviously it evolves as your book goes on. You can't have like nested special worlds, but you know, the concept remains the same is that in every book you need to still follow or not, you don't need to, but for like, good you know for good writing and to follow a sort of time-worn successful story you typically follow this path line from like a certain point you get my drift so the approach to the innermost cave is supposed to be you know where that penultimate battle happens so against the balrog in the mines of moria for the lord of the rings fellowship of the ring in the twin towers that's helm's deep for all of our friends they're literally that that is where you know shiz is hitting the fan Okay, that's basically what's happening. And then, you know, that's where the, the big battle is happening and, and you, you end it. And this is still within the special world. You're not leaving it yet. But you end it with ordeal, death, and rebirth. So basically, and that's literal or figurative. Your character needs to die and be reborn. So let's talk Frodo, right? I think in the first one, that's when Boromir it uh betrays him and he realizes he needs to leave his friends that he can't stay with the fellowship so that's i believe that constitutes as frodo's rebirth um another a literal example would be when aragorn dies in in the second one spoilers um <laughs> when aragorn like falls off a cliff or something that's a literal like rebirth and death for him because he comes out of it much stronger he has these crazy visions about um forgot her name uh, I'm on a roll today but basically it's where your character has a chance to become stronger and after this comes the reward and the reward is also known as seizing the sword and it's like it's getting a reward or it's getting what you came for uh, in order to make the entire process worthwhile so in the case of Frodo and Sam it was like seeing Moria or not Moria seeing um uh, the volcano, the place where they have, to, huh? Mordor. Thank you, Mordor. Jeez, I am on a roll for forgetting stuff today. Mordor, they they see Mordor in the distance. They're like, all right, we're closer. That's that's the literal reward for them. Um, for the others, it's realizing that they have to move on. I don't know. Fellowship of the Ring has a really sad reward at the end. Um, but obviously, the major reward is destroying the ring and be a being able to finally go home. That is their literal reward, what Frodo and Sam have been dreaming about for two and a half movies, because the first half of the first one is them dreaming about leaving and then realizing they're idiots. Um, so that's the basic concept, is you, whatever you left for, you get this as a reward after dying, or literally dying, and you are able so in the in the sense okay so one another example that's quite literal would be the holy grail or king arthur's sword that would be the reward because it's also a power that allows you to defeat the great evil 
And that actually begins the road back, which takes you back into the regular, the ordinary world. And that leads from the road back, resurrection, and return with the elixir. Now, the, the road back is still fraught with peril. That does not, that's not like a, like a, like a spring in your step kind of thing. Or it could be. Um, like an example would be E.T. When uh, the kid, you know, after the kid's trying to get E.T. back to his UFO, I think. It's been a really long time. It's been a really long time. They're trying to get back home. It's still dangerous. He, like, he's got E.T. on the bicycle, like, you know, going, and they're still trying to escape bad, you know, the bad guys. There's, you know, that he's got, it's in the home stretch, but things can still go wrong, basically. And the resurrection is another opportunity for your character to sort of, like, at this point, your character is still within the special world. Like, they may have murdered, they may have blood on their hands. They don't feel like they'll fit in with the ordinary world. Like, you don't just go from point A to point B. You have to take the journey in between. You have to be ready. Well, you, okay, you don't go from point A to point C. You got to take point B. Um, that's a better metaphor. Um, so your character needs to be able to reconcile with the changes that they have and be able to re-enter the ordinary world. And obviously the last one, Return with the Elixir, is it could be literal, it could not be, it could be information it could be the fact that you've saved the universe which is what frodo did um it could be a literal elixir like bringing home a cure for your your race's dying people like let's let's talk fantasy for a second your character leaves home to find a cure for their people that's a literal elixir that they're coming home with that they have to have is an actual cure for their people um and then that's it that's the end ha da da end <laughs> So that's basically the hero's journey. There are a lot of changes to this. Like, um, this one that I have here is actually called Hero with a Thousand Faces. And this is all still broken down into three bits. Um, it starts with departure and separation. That's, that's part one. You have World of Common Day, which is the common world. Call to Adventure, Refusal of Call, Supernatural Aid. That's kind of a weird one. It could be like the memory of your, your mother or it could be literal where you get literal supernatural aid like Gandalf. Um, so it's the mentor, basically. Crossing of the First Threshold, Belly of the Whale. The Belly of the Whale, I think, is supposed to represent the lowest point. It's supposed to be like like the lowest point for your character then you're into part two which is descent initiation and penetration yeah that is what that says i was like really um one road of trials which is basically just your character having to go through the tests that we mentioned earlier two meeting with the goddess that one that one that one's phrasing always throws me off and i don't think i ever have that correct but i'm pretty sure it means like, okay, an example of this would be Frodo meeting Galadriel. That would be meeting with the goddess. But also, woman as a temptress is still Galadriel because she obviously is like, yo, give me the ring. Um, so that's part three is woman as a temptress. So he meets, Frodo meets the goddess, Galadriel, and then is tempted by her to give her the ring. Four is uh, atonement with the father. That could be literal father. It could not be. At one point, Frodo, I think, meets Bilbo. And it's like he feels, I think he felt regret or something. And he sees Bilbo. And by seeing Bilbo, that actually invigorates him to try harder. Because, you know, that that's kind of a skewed one. In a literal, a literal uh, interpretation of that would be like a character who's fallen out with their father at the beginning of the story. And literally like needs their father's approval in order to become a hero so it'd be like a character who you know like let's say it's a baseball game right and the dad wanted their son to become I don't know a doctor and so he's like I'm not going to support you and then the coach comes up and says this is his dream but he won't achieve it unless you believe in him and then the father comes to the baseball game that it's literally that <laughs> um so number five is apotheosis I don't remember what that means <laughs> I actually don't remember what that means. I hear the word apotheosis and I think of the staff at Oblivion. So comment section below if you remember, if you know what that is in the uh, face of a thousand, the hero of a thousand faces. And then six, the ultimate boon. I think it's rebirth. I think apotheosis is supposed to be the rebirth. Um, six, the ultimate boon. So that's like, oh, that would be Frodo receiving the light of Elendil. A lot of these words I don't remember. Um, from Galadriel. So the light that saves him from the giant spider Aragog. Or is that the one in Harry Potter? I always get them mixed up. 
Um, now you finally have part three, which is called The Return. One is the refusal of the return. So basically your hero is not ready to return. Frodo would not. Uh, let's We're going to paraphrase here because this does not happen. Um, let's say Frodo decides he's not ready to return because he's not the same person that he was. He's, does, he's not going to fit in with the hobbits, obviously. That doesn't happen. He just goes home. But <laughs> that would be what that is. Um, magic flight. The eagles. I guess getting home quickly. I, I think that's literally the eagles is what falls underneath this at the end of the third movie. Um, number three, rescue from within. I think that would constitute as Sam trying to, or, you know, Frodo falling prey to the ring and then Gollum being the one to save him, even though that's not from within. So I don't know. Um, it's basically, you're, it's supposed to come from within you. The power comes from within um, number four is crossing the threshold, so crossing back into the ordinary world. Five is the literal return into your ordinary world. Six is uh, master of two worlds. So basically this person has come back better than they have ever been. They've come home, but they will not be the person that they were before. They have the experiences of both the, the, the special world and the new world. And then last but not least, the freedom to live. So their life is theirs. They are free to live on. They are end of story get married have you know life whatever you do you <laughs> so basically that is the hero's journey if you would like to add anything to this please do in the comment section below this is very much a discourse video uh obviously not professional in the slightest should have led with that because we're gonna get people in here who are like what is this video not professional um, but, you know, it's a really interesting concept, and I actually love reading about this, and a book that I would totally suggest if you want to read more about this, I have not finished it, I have not finished anything, is this one. I am reading The Writer's Journey. It basically, uh, connects you to the hero's journey. So, you as a writer to the hero's journey, and, uh, let's see, I have for sure, yeah, there's, like, loads of diagrams. On, I can't see if you can see this, my face is behind the book, but I'm gonna assume that you saw that. Um... And that's basically that. And I love reading about this stuff. Like, this stuff is so fascinating to me and so cool because it's all about writing and I love writing. And learning more about this stuff is super addictive. Like, I love picking up new material on, on writing techniques and all that fun stuff. And I don't know. I thought I'd share with you guys what I've learned. So, yeah. I guess that's kind of what this video was, was uh, what I've learned about writing and preparation for NaNoWriMo. So let me know what you guys think of the hero's journey and anything you have to add about the hero's journey in the comments section below. Uh, let me know if you are uh, applying it seriously or loosely to your stories, if it's in the exact same order that it is almost always written in, or if it has a brand new order. And I can't wait to hear, I can't wait to read all of your comments. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.